Right. Also during this year of good feelings, we have the Panic of 1819. The causes. Looking at the notes, rather than regulating the currency and loans issued by local banks, the Bank of the U.S. actually contributed to widespread speculation, mostly in land, after the War of 1812. People speculating they can buy it cheap, sell it not cheap. When European demand for American farm goods decreased in 1819, this speculative bubble burst. So, uh, once people didn't buy as many American crops, didn't need as many American crops, we were getting competition from Europe, uh, the value of the land began, or stopped increasing as rapidly, and began going down in some, in some parts. So the speculative bubble burst. Uh, dropping land prices ruined farmers and businessmen who could no longer pay their loans, banks failed, and unemployment spread in eastern cities. The short-lived Panic of 1819 disrupted the political harmony established after the war's end. Some states controversially provided relief to debtors, much to the chagrin of creditors. Uh, most important, the panic reinforced many Americans' long-standing distrust of banks, and it undermined the reputation of the Bank of the United States, which was, which was blamed for the panic, which it was partially to blame. When states retaliated against the bus by t taxing its local branches, the Supreme Court, and the state would be Maryland, for example, the Supreme Court under John Marshall ruled in, ruled in McCulloch v. Maryland, remember this, that the bus was a legitimate exercise of congressional authority under the Constitution. In other words, John Marshall said, since the Constitution, you're right, does, n does not say that we can have a bank, but it does say we can do other things for which a bank is needed. So the Constitution does have implied powers. This directly contradicted the strict constructionist view that Congress could use only those powers expressed in the Constitution. So that brings us to the election of 1820, which we said Monroe won quite easily over John Quincy Adams, uh, Democrat-Republican versus Independent-Republican. The green would be Monroe. All right. The Compromise of 1820, a fire bell in the night. In 1819, when Missouri applied for statehood, that's what began this whole thing, a New York Republican proposed that Congress forced the new state constitution to ban the importation of slaves and free slave children upon reaching age 25. And he wanted them to free the slave children when they became 25. The Republican Party split along sectional lines on the Missouri question. Most Northern Republicans supported the restrictions, while Southern Republicans opposed them. In 1820, a compromise was reached which allowed Missouri to adopt a constitution without the anti-slavery restrictions and allowed Maine, which prohibited slavery, to become a free state. So the compromise was Maine slave, I'm sorry, Maine free, Missouri slave, um, and this is to maintain the sectional balance of slave states versus free states. And slavery would be prohibited in all remaining territory of the Louisiana Purchase north of the 3630 line, that green line you see there. In other words, under the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the remaining Louisiana Purchase Territory was divided into slave and free zones. The Missouri Compromise showed that sectional divisions over slavery's westward expansion seriously endangered the Union. The domination of the presidency by Virginians since the founding, except the, ter the term of John, a uh, John Adams, reinforced Northerners' sense that southern slave owners dominated national politics. And again, this is largely due to the three-fifths compromise. And they knew that more slave states would mean more political power for the South in Congress. In other words, they did not oppose the expansion of slavery for moral reasons, remember this, or concern for the welfare of the slaves. It was more political. They don't want them having so much power over the North. Both Thomas Jefferson and John Quincy Adams suggested that the Missouri controversy revealed a, a secret underlying sectional divide that will come back and threaten the Union. It's a fire bell in the night. It wakens me in, in nightmares. This is the issue that eventually sparks the Civil War. So he was right. Oh, yeah, and this is, uh, remember this, Missouri, when they did become a, uh, a state, they barred free blacks from the state to avoid competition with white farmers and workers. Remember, the market revolution was kicking in, which we will get to, and a slowly increasing number of people were working for wages. So because they, they banned free blacks from the state, a second Missouri Compromise was necessary to rectify that. Moving on, 
the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, often referred to as America's Self-Defense Doctrine. Okay, if you look at the notes underneath, between 1810 and 1822, Spain's Latin American colonies rebelled and established independent nations, including Mexico, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Peru. By 1825, Spain's empire in the West contained only Cuba and Puerto Rico, which we get eventually. Americans sympathized with these Republican revolutions, and the United States was the first to recognize these new governments. John Quincy Adams, Monroe's Secretary of State, feared that Spain might try to regain its former colonies, and in 1823 he drafted a speech for the president which became known as the Monroe Doctrine. This doctrine stated that the U.S. would oppose any future efforts by European powers to colonize the Americas, and wanted them to abstain from involvement. We would abstain for, from involvement in Europe's wars, and we would prevent European nations from interfering in new Latin American nations. We basically said, Europe, you can have Africa. Do not come over here to Latin America. If you do, we will consider it an act of war. This doctrine assumed that the old and new world were separate political and diplomatic systems and claimed for the U.S. the role, and here it is, claimed the role of the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere for us, for ourselves. Adams also meant to secure the commerce of the region for the United States, as opposed to British interests. So historians discuss, they debate, were we protecting Latin America or were we claiming Latin America? Hmm, was it both? Moving on. The election of 1824, the corrupt bargain. The note you should jot down here is this ends the era of good feelings. Okay. In the 1824 presidential election, only candidate Andrew Jackson, known for his military victories, had nationwide support. The other candidates, John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, William Crawford of Georgia, who eventually has a stroke during the campaign, and Henry Clay of Kentucky, uh, they found support mostly in their regions. So the only one that was national was, was Jackson. Though Jackson received the largest tally of the popular vote, remember, white men were getting the right to vote during this time, and carried all regions except for New England, none of the candidates received a majority of electoral college votes. So none received enough electoral votes to automatically win the election. So running last, uh, so what that means is the House decides. If the electoral college doesn't decide, the House decides. So running last and eliminated, Henry Clay used his influence to lead the House into electing John Quincy Adams as president, whom Clay believed would promote the American system. Clay was soon appointed Secretary of State. This appointment led to charges that a corrupt bargain between Clay and Adams had secured the presidency for Adams and laid the basis for the emergence of a Democratic Party behind Andrew Jackson's candidacy in the next election of 1824. The alliance around Adams and Clay came to form the opposition Republican or Whig Party in the 1830s. So the Democratic Jewish Republican Party split in half, one side Jackson, one side Quincy Adams. The accusation was, once the election went to the House, it, uh, Henry Clay couldn't be considered because he came in fourth place. Only the top three candidates are considered by the House. Uh, Crawford had a stroke, so he wasn't considered, so it was between Jackson and Adams. And the House chose John Quincy, even though he got less popular votes. Uh, Henry Clay claims he chose Andrew Jackson, I'm sorry, John Quincy, because he would support the American system more than Jackson would. Uh, Jackson uh, and, and John Quincy quickly appointed Henry Clay Secretary of State, which was often seen as a stepping stone to the presidency. So Andrew Jackson accused the two of uh, coming to a backroom deal where Henry Clay would use his influence in the House, he was Speaker of the House, to get them to elect John Quincy Adams, and John Quincy would then appoint Henry Clay Sec Secretary of State, so in eight years he could run for president. All right, there's no smoking gun that there was a corrupt bargain, but we will have a lesson in class, possibly, where we will look at the evidence and maybe decide for ourselves. All right, so if you look at that, and this was the end of the era of good feelings, we now had two parties, once we get to this corrupt bargain of 1824, um, if you look at the popular vote, Andrew Jackson got 43% of the popular vote, but only 99% of the electoral vote. John Quincy gets less. He gets chosen by the House, and you get the accusations of a corrupt bargain. So 
for the ear of good feelings. Remember that for the most part, nationalism won out. We had good feelings, all the, the, na the nation gaining in strength. Highways and canals and boundaries were changed in our favor. Uh, Indians were going away or going west. But underlying this was this feeling of sectionalism, of the west loathing banks and, and the east uh, loving banks and loving the American system. Uh, and, and slavery was also in the background. So the seeds for sectionalism were, were hidden during this era somewhat, were put to sleep, but were going to come back and haunt us. So be sure to take the quiz that will pop up right now.